Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Tanks with the Mighty Jingles, where today we are joining Lestad in this tier 6 random battle here on the Studzianki map. And he is driving. Look, if you don't know what that machine is, it's entirely understandable, um, because of course it never existed. It's part of an entire line of machines that never actually existed. I mean, people thought that Wargaming were taking the piss when they introduced Chinese tank destroyers, an entire tech tree line, of which only one ever actually existed, and it was Russian. Um, but they finally introduced an entirely fictional tech tree line of vehicles into the game, the Japanese tank destroyers. It was inevitable, I suppose, although I don't know why anybody should be surprised. It's not like, you know, introducing stuff that never existed is something new as far as this game is concerned. And I'm not just talking about the fact that the game's over a decade old and they've run out of stuff that actually existed to put into the game. Well, the tanks has always included vehicles that never existed. And no, I'm not even talking about the mouse either. I mean, technically you could argue that that existed. I mean, the hull existed. Uh, but was it a tank? Because tanks require turrets and the mouse never had a working turret. It was more of a demonstrator than an actual tank, but it, you could at least argue that it existed. But I'm not even talking about that. Right back at the beginning of World of Tanks, they introduced a tech tree line of vehicles, the majority of which never actually existed. I'm talking about the, uh, the Soviet artillery line. It's not that the Red Army didn't have good artillery. They did. They had lots and lots and lots of very good artillery, but almost none of it was self-propelled, so... <laughs> Yeah, right at the beginning of World of Tanks we had an entire tech tree line, the majority of which were entirely fictional, but they're really taking the piss with these Japanese tank destroyers. In fact, you could make a convincing argument that World of Tanks have been taking the piss with the Japanese tech tree as a whole since its introduction. At least if you're making the argument from an historical accuracy point of view, and let's face it, World of Tanks has never really cared about historical accuracy. I mean, it, it uses the historical accuracy argument when it suits it and conveniently ignores it when it doesn't. Notice Lestad here, getting out while the getting's good. This is a man who recognises a collapsing flank when he sees one, but he's not just abandoning the flank, he's pulling back to a better position. A position where, with a little bit of luck, a healthy dose of skill, and a solid knowledge of the game mechanics, he should be able to prop this flank up, and not just abandon it entirely. So, anyway, the historical accuracy argument. I mean, the counter-argument has always been, eh, it's an arcade game, who cares? And, you know, that's a, that's a valid argument, but, well, we care. Obviously, a lot of us care about historical accuracy, which is why we're playing World of Tanks and not Mech Warrior. Not that there's anything wrong with Mech Warrior, but there's nothing historically accurate about it. It's about as historically accurate as this Japanese tank destroyer line. The thing that I find most amusing about this Tier 5 Japanese tank destroyer, the Honey 3, is the fact that it's called the Honey 3. What happened to the Honey 1 and 2? Well, nothing, because they never existed. <laughs> this thing never existed, so why call it the Honey 3? Because by calling it the Mark 3 version of something that never existed in the first place, you're implying it's like you're setting up a false artificial history of the development of this thing that never happened with a Mark I and a Mark II that existed before it, which, of course, they didn't. And you haven't even put the Mark I or Mark II into the game. <laughs> it's just such an utterly bizarre naming convention. Why call it the Mark... I mean, if you've made this thing up anyway, I suppose you may as well make up its previous versions as well, but then put them into the game, but which they haven't done. This thing's actually based on the whole of the Japanese Tier 3 light tank, whose name I can't remember. It definitely wasn't the whole Nino, that much I can guarantee you. Um, and that's at least historically consistent, if not historically accurate. Because that's basically what the Germans did with their obsolete tanks. They ripped the turrets off, stuck a slightly bigger gun inside and called them Panzerjägers. They did that with the Panzer II, they did it with the Panzer III. Uh, the Panzer III was actually the basis for the Stug. Which is why it was called the Stug III. There was no Stug I and Stug II. They were called the Stug III because they were based on Panzer III's. Ah, maybe that's why it's called the Honey 3. It's based on the whole of the Panzer... No. <laughs> no, they're just making shit up. Oh, hang on, Excelsior. We're coming. D okay, never mind. Well, it did work. I mean, falling back to the second line and using that concealment and perhaps cynically allowing his teammates to take the hits for him and do the spotting for him, it has mostly stabilised this flank. There's just possibly one enemy tank left over here. 
And when you're in a machine that only has 25 millimeters of armor, you really don't want to be getting shot at by anything. Oh yeah, 25 millimeters of armor. That's another thing about the Japanese light tanks, like the one that this is based on. They weren't actually light tanks. I mean, they were. By the standards of every other nation that was manufacturing tanks, Japan built a lot of light tanks, but as far as the Japanese were concerned, most of them were medium tanks. They just had a different standard. Although, in the defense of the Imperial Japanese Army, the tanks that they were building and using were, you know, by the standards of everybody else, kind of under-armored and under-gunned, they were perfectly well suited for the conflicts that the Japanese Army were fighting in. The island hopping campaigns in the Pacific, jungle fighting in Burma, the war in mainland China, because the Chinese didn't have any tanks. It doesn't matter if your tanks are crap, if the people you're fighting either don't have tanks or have a very, very limited availability of anti-tank guns. You know, crack tanks will do. Oh, there's the T-3485. And he's seen you. Well, you've been spotted, that doesn't mean he's paying attention. And that's the last remaining enemy on this flank. You need to get a move on though, Lestat, because you are losing 8 kills to 10. Although the hit point difference isn't that bad. Now, is his gun pointing this way? It was, and it didn't do him any good. <laughs> that was a hell of a snapshot. But anyway, yeah, Japanese and crack tanks, which, you know, historically didn't matter because they weren't really fighting anybody who had either a lot of or any tanks in the first place or employed a lot of anti-tank guns. So historically, not actually a problem, but when you come to introduce an entire nation into a game like World of Tanks that historically only really had crap tanks. <laughs> you can see why you have to start making shit up. Uh, you have the entire Japanese heavy line that basically never existed. In fact, most of the Japanese mediums suffer from the same problem because Japanese medium tanks were considered light tanks by the standard of everybody else who was building tanks. If you go from like tier 6 all the way up to tier 9, um, they either only existed in prototype form, never existed, or they were actually American <laughs> with some modifications. Meanwhile, things are not going particularly well for Lestat, despite his uh, spirited defense of the southern flank here. There's only three of them left, and one of them is artillery against six enemies. And three of them are artillery. And when you're in a machine that only has 25 millimeters of armor, you really can't afford to get spotted because there's three artillery. Okay, the M44 took the hit and fell back. Good. It's nice to see he is actually aware of what's going on around him. And that up there is, well, it's another machine that didn't actually exist, the Chinese tank destroyer. Although Wargaming did at least have the decency to give the Chinese tank destroyers suffixes FT, which of course stands for fake tank. <laughs> Come on. Falling back. Now he's going to have to move up and attempt to respot. Oh, another fake tank. This battle's just crawling with shit that never existed. Okay, it's good to see that the M10 is baiting him into chasing him which allows Lestat to get some side shots in, and he's going to have to respot him, but Lestat is about to discover one rather large limitation on this machine. It's very narrow gun traverse. Oh, the artillery took a shot, and the M10 finishes him. But taking the shot like that from the position that the artillery was in, well, let's just uh, rewind and see what happens. Notice the artillery not hiding behind the bushes at the point where he makes his shot. And there are three artillery in play on the enemy team. Here they come. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh dear. Oh well, never mind. Uh, the stat getting a little bit nervous there. He's like, get away from me, get away from me. <laughs> There's three artillery in play. Wasn't actually the artillery that got him. Respotted. Our little Chinese friend up there pulls back from the bush. I mean, he knows roughly where he's getting murdered from, but he can't actually see him until too late. Oh shit, and... Oh, there's an enemy Honey 3 up there. That's bad news. He took a hit, backs up behind the wreck of the artillery to protect him from direct fire, and then starts moving. And I'm actually quite surprised that the M... I mean, there's one. Well, I suppose they don't reload instantly. It's also possible that the M10 got spotted over there to the east, and they were shifting their sights to him. Either which, it means that Lestad has gotten away with it. 
and is falling back to the next line of cover. He's doing a lot of this in this battle, and there's a good reason for it. It works. He knows that there is another tank destroyer up there. The artillery are continuing to barrage his last reported position, but he's well out of there by now, and he's waiting to see what's what. There's another curious thing about this machine. I mean, its gun isn't bad. It's got a 75mm gun. Remember, it's based on the whole of the Japanese Tier 3 light tank, which I think only featured a selection of 37mm guns. But, like I said, if not historically accurate, at least historically consistent. You take an obsolete tank, you rip the turret off to make space for a bigger gun. Bingo, you've got yourself a tank destroyer. The Germans did this very successfully with the Stugs, uh, arguably the most successful armoured fighting vehicle of the war. But in World of Tanks, at least, what, what tends to happen when they introduce a tank destroyer? In order to make up for the rather significant tactical vulnerability of not having a turret, they give it a better gun than comparable medium and sometimes heavy tanks at the same tier. And they haven't, they haven't really done that with this thing. I mean, this 75mm gun isn't bad, but it's not that much better than the typical 75mm guns that you see Oh, hello. We're going to get that Bishop. Using the buildings as cover. He hasn't been spotted. Looks like the M10 must have been the one that clocked him. And yet didn't have a shot. Hello! But this is what I mean. One. Two. Three. It's going to take four shots. He tries to go for the ram, but when you only have 25 millimeters of armor, you don't do a lot of ramming damage. Four shots to take out the same tier artillery. This is not a particularly good gun. It certainly doesn't feel like a tank destroyer gun. It, in fact, even has a worse rate of fire than the 75 and 76mm guns featured on the same tier mediums like the M4 Sherman and the Panzer IV. So, uh, huh? Yeah. Now, they've got two choices here. They can either go for the enemy cap or lie up here and attempt to murder anybody trying to go for their cap. And it looks like that's what they're doing, or at least Lestat is. And sure enough, because remember, there was a tank destroyer just to the north of their cap circle. And he's had all the time in the world to slip into that cap circle, and yet he hasn't. The enemy team have more than double the hit points and one extra tank. And sure enough, somebody's capping. M10 just spotted the enemy M44, so we know it's not him. It's got to be that tank destroyer, right? Well, you'd think so, but it isn't, because he is down there, which means it's the gorilla in the cap circle. Good news, the M10 manages to get a damaging shot off, and has also apparently done some damage to the enemy M44, because the hit point totals between the two teams are now pretty much even. The bad news, Lestad got spotted. And there are still two artillery in play, which means he either has to find an artillery safe spot or keep moving. Further bad news, these two machines are now in... Well, they technically are in one-shot kill territory, but they both need a better than average damage roll. So we're talking two-shot kill territory, and that heavily favours whoever gets the first shot off. Or whoever doesn't get hit by artillery. Yes. <laughs> Here's the problem. He's now in an artillery safe spot. There's only two minutes of this battle remaining. He can't count on any support from the M10 just yet, who still has the M44 and the Gorilla to worry about. And he's got less than 30 seconds to take care of the Gorilla, or they're going to lose to capping. So, and he's got him. Hooray. Okay, so they don't have to worry about the cap. The thing is, whoever pokes their nose around the corner first year is going to lose, because that will allow the enemy to get the first shot off. And if they don't get one shot killed, they will get two shot killed, because whoever fires first reloads first. So they're both playing a game of chicken here and waiting to see who blinks first. However, the M10 has also nailed the M44, which means that Honey 3 has now run out of friends, and the advantage has swung in favour of Lestat, because the M10 is heading this way, so that enemy TD is now in an extremely unfortunate situation. Lestat is not taking the bait, he's not giving them the opportunity to get the first shot off, and he needs to get the first shot off in order to stand a chance of winning, because the longer he hides behind that corner, the quicker he's going to become the filling in the tank destroyer sandwich as the M10 closes in from the north. 
He tries to side scrape around the corner, but he doesn't have a turret, and we've already established that this thing has an extremely narrow firing arc, and, well, I mean, he didn't have an awful lot of good choices there. Maybe, and the odds still weren't great, but maybe if he'd made his move when he still had two artillery to back him up, the outcome would have been different, but, well, he didn't, so it wasn't. Great game there from Lestat in the all-new, all-singing, all-dancing, and, of course, entirely fictional Tier 5 Japanese tank destroyer, the Honey 3. And for once it was nice to see that the two surviving guys on the team, both with enough kills for a Brothers in Arms medal, had the foresight to create a battlefield platoon at the end of it in order to actually get that Brothers in Arms medal. Well done of course, not just to Lestat, but also Hugh Dog there in the M10 RBFM. Once again, two random players exploiting the teamwork consumable while it's still free and before Wargaming figure out a way of packaging it and selling it to you in the premium shop. Well done to both of them, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.